Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois at Reformed Forum. Delighted to be back for another conversation this week. Looking forward to it. And we have with us one of our regulars, a co-founder, uh, Jeff Waddington, who is pastor-elect, just waiting on this pandemic to get to, to get all this uh, worked out. Actually, it's in your hands. You're, you haven't been installed yeah. yet, but it, but uh, things have gone through Presbytery. He's at uh, Faith OPC in Fawn Grove, Pennsylvania, calling in from Norristown. Welcome, Jeff. It's good to see you today. Thank you. Good to be here. Good to be involved in this conversation. Yes, uh, we are going to be speaking about some important matters uh, regarding uh, Reformed Orthodoxy and uh, Protestant scholasticism. Talking about the uh, divine simplicity once again. I know it's been uh, kind of on our agenda, but uh, we're coming at it from different angles and always excited about new articles, essays, books written on the subject so that we can discuss them. And today we're welcoming to the program for the first time uh, Mr. Ryan Hurd, who is an editor, a teacher, and a translator, as well as a member of the OPC. Uh, he's a member out in our Ada, Michigan church, and uh, he's calling in today, too, from a distance. So welcome to the program, Ryan. It's good to see you. Good to meet you in person-ish, and <laughs> and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Uh, it's really great to be here. It's a privilege. Yeah. Well, we're excited to speak with you today. Uh, Ryan has written uh, an important article uh, which is in the Confessional Presbyterian Journal, uh, one of the new issues on Gespertus uh, Vucis. Um, doing my best here with the pronunciation. I'm not as bad as our our fellow from New Jersey, right, Jeff? But I, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> our good friend, uh, the running joke, uh, Vucis, uh, and and uh, he wrote a piece on God's single, absolutely simple essence. So we're going to uh, speak with Ryan about that today, as Ryan has translated that, and then it is included in uh, the Confessional Presbyterian Journal. Uh, so we'll have links to all that in the episode description for people to, to click on, be able to go subscribe and get a copy of the journal. We always love the journal. Uh, Jeff serves as an editor there, and we've, we've spoken about many issues of that journal over the years. It was uh, started as perhaps maybe like a four-issue little set, and it's been going on for what? How many issues have there been now, Jeff? Uh, 16 will be the, this, this coming year, mm -hmm. or this year, I should say. It's been so 16 years. A lot of a lot of good, a lot of good. Yep. So we're very thankful for that. It takes up a good chunk of my bookshelf now. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Something to look at. Really, really good printings. So we're going to be speaking about uh, that here, and it's 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 printed in an in an older way, but in a new newer way. We don't always see this translations that the original is actually included. So we see that in you know the CPJ will often uh, print its articles in two column format. And uh, it's a larger format publication, so we have two sizable columns. But here, once uh, Ryan finishes his introduction to the to the work, we have his excellent translation in the left-hand column, but then we have uh, the original Latin in the right hand. Is this properly called a diglot? Is this a proper diglot, or is that even more specific than what I'm saying, Ryan? Uh, I think... Suppose you could call it a diglot. I'm not aware of any more technical usage of diglot, but perhaps there is one. Yeah, usually you'll see that at least in book format. Sometimes where the facing pages are mm. English and Latin. There's a, ver a pretty well-known version of uh, Thomas's Summa Theologiae um, right. that way. But uh, anyway, it's, it's quite helpful, and uh, especially for people who know Latin, not myself, but uh, they can compare and uh, look at the original, which is always, always helpful and advantageous. Got a few things to mention. Uh, we've, we've recorded several episodes, so um, I'm not, I haven't looked at the calendar to know precisely when this episode will be released, although it'll be sometime in the month of May. Uh, but uh, I encourage everyone to head on over to reformedforum.org. Uh, just to find out what's new there. And uh, while you're at it, if you're not already, subscribe to the email newsletter. There's a form at the bottom of the webpage down in the footer for you to do that. And if you subscribe to our email newsletter, you'll you'll receive all sorts of updates, news, and information about what we're doing. We've got some important things launching very soon, and, and I let the email newsletter list or the news the the uh, email list know about those things first and foremost. And uh, also, if you um, subscribe, you'll you'll receive an automatic, like a welcome email, which will include a PDF uh, download link to our latest uh, print newsletter. So we're looking forward to that coming out in uh, the fall. Uh, next issue, which we're going to be speaking about the attributes of God in preparation of our 
uh, theology conference conference, which we're hoping will not be uh, uh, I don't know prevented from by our by our, the governor of Illinois. We're still planning on an in person meeting and doing everything there. So hopefully things will be better and and okay by that time. We'll have to see. Um, but in preparation of that, uh, if you'd like to read up on the attributes of God, uh, which pertains to a lot of what we're talking about today, then uh, you can subscribe and get a copy of that newsletter. There's also a newsletter form on the website if you'd like to sign up for our mailing list, a physical mailing list. And we'll make, make sure you get a copy of that, uh, at least to those U.S. addresses, because um, the post office is helping us out. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, and a lot of other things going on, and you can stay in touch with us through the website at reformedforum.org. Thank you so much. Well, Jeffrey, tell me a bit about your experience with uh, Vucic as we start. Um, you know, certainly a, a, an enormous figure of uh, Reformed Orthodoxy and Protestant scholasticism, but uh, not a household name, at least in most households. Maybe yours, Ryan. But uh, <laughs> Jeff, uh, what, what's been your familiarity? Well, um, not a lot. The, his name, yes. I, you know, I first heard Vucic's name, I think, from... Uh, the mouth of Harvey uh, Kong back 20 some years ago at Westminster. Uh, And then I'm aware of a debate uh, that raged in, in the Netherlands uh, during his time between uh, Lucius on the one side and Coxeus on the other, typically understood to be a systematics versus redemptive historical uh, debate, although that may be anachronistic, putting it in that, those terms. Uh, but this may have been the first actual uh, piece of literature of, of his that I've read uh, that I remember. Mm. It's very, very, very much, uh, though Ryan says it's much simpler than the high uh, medieval scholastics, it, it's much higher than what us uh, 21st century uh, guys are <laughs> used to in terms of technical sure uh, discussions. Sure, Ryan, I'd be I'd love for you to tell us a bit about the Latin they're in, but even before we get to that, just describing your personal studies and uh, you know facility with the language and just your your general work as a translator. How did you how did you become a uh, someone who's translating classic Latin works of theology? Uh, largely through accident, I suppose. I took a class in seminary with Todd Rester, actually. Oh, wonderful. Uh, now the, uh, the Latinist out in Westminster, and uh, he's quite a, quite a profound uh, Latinist in his own right, translating uh, another Dutchman, Petrus von Maastricht's mm-hmm. Theoretica Practica Theologia. And uh, so I took a Latin class from him in seminary. I think it was my last uh, my, one of my last classes. And then I spent the entire summer sitting in a lawn chair in a baseball field every day, all day long, reading Thomas Aquinas in the Summa to, you know, get my Latin up to par and was beginning to just surf PRDL and uh, started really very early trying to translate and working very hard at that. So I translated Amandus Polanus' uh, book on the essence and attributes of God is the most sophisticated wow. treatment of the essence and attributes published during this time period. Uh, I've published quite a lot by Junius, a large number, a large number of disputations on Holy Scripture by him, uh, some on doctrine of God. I've translated a bunch of Macovius, guys like this, and you know, just working on translations throughout. I came across this piece by Gispardus Vucis and was very excited about it. I study Reformed Orthodox and especially Doctrine of God. And I noticed in reading through basically as much as I could of the treatments of the divine simplicity during this time period, that this was probably the most significant treatment and certainly the most significant I've come across personally. Wow. So uh, it's something that I set myself to translating and it was a, a beast to translate, but I'm glad it's done. And, well, you know, and we're very thankful for your work that, uh, now we get to, to share in the fruits of those labors. I got to follow up with something like, was there a baseball game going on while you were translating was, and uh, reading it's the Latin? a long story, uh, but yeah, it was just an old baseball field. I sat there in the sun all day long and read through the Summa and, <laughs> 
uh, yeah. So it was a place. It wasn't as if you were uh, you were going to games. Like you didn't have season no, tickets it, somewhere. It, it was definitely a state of mind. You know, you're reading the angelic doctor. You, you're ascending the chain of being. <laughs> So you were reading the Latin uh, edition of, yeah. of the text. Wow. Okay. That's good. Very, very good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's speak about uh, Vucis a bit in terms of his biography. Uh, you, you know, give us his, provide us his dates, and maybe you can let us know a little bit about the man and uh, where this particular piece fits within his overall corpus. Yeah, uh, so Gaspardus Wuchis lived uh, 1589 to 1676. He was an extremely towering figure in the Reformed Orthodox uh, pedigree. Uh, during particularly the earlier period of Reformed Orthodoxy, he taught at Utrecht throughout his whole theological career and through his influence really invested in the rising generation of Reformed Orthodox to come, and quite a central figure, uh, exceptionally powerful. I would argue probably he was the best Reformed theologian during the Reformed Orthodox period as a whole, mm -hmm. certainly was the best in the Netherlands, uh, challenged only perhaps by Petrus van Maastricht, but I, I don't think really van Maastricht hold the candle to, to butchers personally. Mm -hmm. So very powerful uh, very influential. He's best known today probably for uh, two works that he published. Uh, one is the Politica Ecclesiastica. It was published in three volumes, 1663 to 76. And then uh, a five-volume set of select disputations, uh, which is actually the set from which this piece comes from. It's published during 16... 48 to 1669, so quite a long time period of uh, revised and edited disputations that he held as theological professor uh, occupying the, the chair of theology at Utrecht, uh, published. Really, it's, it's what you might say is the equivalent of a systematic theology. It doesn't have that form. It doesn't have that evenness at all, but it's a collection of very aggressive disputations that do course throughout uh, most all of, of the various loci of theology. And uh, I actually brought one, uh, one volume uh, along. It's my personal volume. This is volume, I think, four oh, of nice. that set. And uh, <clears throat> you can find them today on PRDL. Or, uh, this, this volume, actually, I got from the, the William Young Library. No kidding. Uh, that uh, I, I purchased uh, quite a lot of his his books when he passed, and uh, so shout out to my Presbyterian Reform brothers. They, they don't always get a shout out, but this is uh yeah. So you translate it out of this, and uh, and and you'll see the the disputation itself is is quite long and lengthy. If you're familiar with the the, the genre of disputations during this time period, you're going to know that there's a lot of variety that you find. And disputations during the early modern period really harken back toward the earlier medieval uh, schoolman method of doing theology whenever they would reach uh, a, a topic that they need to handle in fuller depth, perhaps they're commenting the sentences or what have you. They have what's called a, a quadlibital disputation, a disputation about anything at all. Hmm. And they, they uh, that's what the word quadlibital, roughly speaking, means uh, about any old subject. <laughs> and uh, so they, they sit down and they work really hard. So you would have someone like a Thomas Aquinas, his De Potentia, a very large work, De, De Veritate. Both of those are, are disputations. Um, in the early modern period, you see uh, a smaller form. You have someone like a Franciscus Junius who's using the disputation method as a lot of the, the Reformed Orthodox and the, the scholastics during this time period did. As something of a method for testing theology students. So in this in this format, the disputations comprise shorter theses that are almost paragraph length or even shorter, a few sentences or one sentence in Latin. And uh, these are uh, theses that the student would memorize and then be tested on orally, either in front of the professor himself or perhaps in front of faculty or even in public. Uh, and, and then you have someone like a Vuchis who uh, advances the disputation model to uh, a, a much 
wider degree, you'll see he's doing a lot of historical spade work here. It's not really pure theology in any sort of the term. He's mixing in philosophy and it's really just a, a place. It's almost a commonplace for him to argue or, or think about an issue. Um, and, and so here for someone like Vuches, it becomes something like a short tract or treatise. And uh, that's what this piece is. Yeah, I think there's something lost, you know, without having the scholastic method these days. And and there's there's something to that method and that approach and uh, of teaching and of reflection where uh, we I, I don't know if people contemporary people really appreciate it. And uh, and it's helpful to kind of learn a bit about how they went about their studies and how people were taught in order to understand and appreciate this particular work. I mean, this this was very common at the time, and it and it, uh, it you know it's a it's a particular type of, of genre, so to speak. But uh, it seems like it's I don't know, it's lost on us these days. It it definitely is, and uh, you know the disputation model and, and the kind of the method of of doing theology was very much a team effort that accumulated over generations of theologians working on the same problems in harmony and unity, and this allowed for. Uh, such precision to uh, to to uh, be produced during this time period. So, as generations of theologians rise up, whether you start in the earlier uh, high medieval period or, or even as you progress along the early modern period, you have the revising of disputations over time. And so, you you have works like the, the probably the most famous disputation set is the of course the Leiden Synopsis Pieroris, uh, published uh, 1620 to 1624 which is the theses that have been honed now over several very technical disputation cycles by various professors of theology and the faculty of Leiden. And here they produce uh, a very, very important early codified statement of reformed theology that has had incredible lasting influence throughout the entire history of reformed theology ever since. In fact, uh, Herman Bobbing, the very first thing he did as an early professor or and not even a, a professor, an early pastor, was he edited an edition of the synopsis hmm. while he was uh, waiting to become professor of theology. And his work, he pictured as very much an updating of the old style of doing theology that you find there. So you have this great pedigree that's influenced even down to someone like a Bob Inka, who, of course, has had great influence on us today. Sure. And in and, and that the synopsis purioris, of course, has been republished by uh, Brill in yep. in a side by side English Latin edition. I sold in my ours. house to get a copy. Yeah, about pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to review it for some journal. That's the only <laughs> way. Oh, rats! Maybe maybe I could get my house back, and uh, <laughs> let's see if someone will give me a review copy. That's always a running joke. Del Brill does excellent work and important work, but uh, the academic publisher model sometimes doesn't lead to uh, accessible purchase prices of the volumes. So, uh, you know, help us understand this um, this work even more, not just now that we know a bit about the genre and, and uh, certain things of the time period, but uh, maybe in a thumbnail sketch, you can help us uh, know what Vuches is arguing for theologically? What's his agenda with this particular piece? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, from the title, it's clear he's going to be talking about the divine simplicity. And really, it's best uh, to understand the divine simplicity, at least as Vuchis is uh, going to be talking about it. And, and it's going to be very much in common with the other Reformed Orthodox and the medievals and these sorts of things. Now, the divine simplicity is, is something that is used in the technical discipline of theology to properly orient us to, to know God. It uh, outlines how we're to move positively through predicating various perfections of the divine. And so for, for Vuchis, as he's going to articulate the divine simplicity, it's not just about defending uh, some uh, metaphysical attribute of God as it's often called today, and, and I think wrongly, but really, He's going to be articulating something like a control for right thinking and speaking about God. And uh, this is really important because abstracting a piece like this from the rest of 
Vuch's theology as it's worked out throughout the rest of the disputations uh, could lend misunderstanding on what simplicity is and what simplicity is actually for Vuch's himself. So whenever you abstract or extract uh, simplicity from its job in theology, it takes on something of a life itso of its own and that occludes what it actually is and what it's intended to be and what it is for theologians of this time period. And that is to say, it's, it's primarily more of a function in theology, which is then reflectively reduced to an attribute. So that when you get to that attribute, you perform that function uh, that that attribute stands for. So it's, it's not really an attribute like other attributes. It's not one of those attributes you find in scripture, like God's love or God's mm -hmm. holiness, but it arises uh, consequence the uh, theological task and then is reduced to an attribute that we talk about to make sure that we're thinking rightly about God as, as we uh, proclaim his praise. So Butchus is doing this. He's arguing as he outlines very early in the treatise, he has some prolegomena points uh, to start off with. He's arguing for a very precise type of simplicity. And th it's probably the most critical point of departure in order to understand what he's doing here is to, to reckon with the precise type of simplicity that he's going to be dealing with throughout. And, and that is, it's an absolute simplicity that he's going to be talking about. So this is not a type of simplicity that's on a sliding scale. It's not a simplicity that's at the top of the ladder of creatures denying composition as you, you work your way up the chain of various ways that creatures can be composed. And then, then eventually as you move through those gradual refinements of composition, you, you then arrive at what which just means by the divine simplicity. That's not it at all. And that would be very wrong to understand him thinking along those lines. Butchus is arguing for a radically other type of simplicity that has zero comparison in the created order. So it's not the simplicity of an angel. Uh, it's not a simplicity that has any sort of comparison to creatures because God is, is wholly other. So there's, no, there's not going to be any instance or point of comparison with other simple things that is going to help you understand the divine simplicity. You just you have to understand these negations from the start, that, hmm. which assumes God is infinitely distanced from creatures by virtue of his being God and, and, and them being creatures. And so the type of simplicity he's positing here is going to reflect that. And... Uh, you know, this is this is not unique to Butchus. This is the fundamental position of all the Reformed Orthodox, all of the Catholics, all of the high medievals. Uh, it's a position, for instance, that Thomas Aquinas occupies. If you read through Butchus carefully, you're going to notice that he's really just a downgrade of Thomas Aquinas. And that's not meant to be an insult to Butchus <laughs> in any respect. <laughs> it's meant to point out the fact that he is actually a Thomist in his formulation of the divine simplicity. He, he definitely decides against SCOTUS uh, in various ways, even while trying to be very, you know, to tiptoe across the, the lines. He doesn't wanna to excise poor SCOTUS and in in, yeah. he's, very, he's very judicious in that. But yeah, it's it's just important to recognize that the type, the type of simplicity is absolute. And you might think of it like this, so as far as the importance of, uh, you know, from the start, reckoning and, and grappling with, with it being this type of simplicity. Well, explain and, that to us a bit about the, the two schools, the predominant schools of, of Thomas and then uh, John Dunn Scotus, how those differ. I think that'd be helpful for many of our viewers and listeners to understand those kind of do two different approaches. We've, we've mentioned them in ways in previous episodes on the subject, but I think uh, reviewing them certainly isn't going to hurt. And, and also a reminder that the Generally speaking and understood, these are these are approaches within orthodoxy. So it's not as, as a Scotus was considered a heretic and then Thomas has an orthodox view, but we very, have two different much. schools and, and rather different approaches within uh, the Catholic yeah. small C tradition. Yes, yeah, that, that's a very crucial point to understand. All of these guys, one of my favorite statements in this entire piece that Butchus says is to an objection uh, that an objector posits who says, oh, you know, the philosophers, no, nobody just, nobody agrees with anybody else. And there's so many different variations of the divine simplicity. Well, Vucius responds, 
well, this is true, but everybody aims at this, <laughs> denying composition of God. So you're absolutely right. There's lots of different ways of casting the divine simplicity. Uh, so to articulate maybe a bit more in the difference between a Thomist and a Scotus variety, uh, and, and, and maybe actually you, you might want to back up and note that Thomists during this time period are going to be different uh, from, from, from Thomas Aquinas, for instance, just like we have in the Reformed world, mm. the Calvin against the Calvinist debates. Jonathan and, Edwards uh, and his so-called followers, right, Jeff? <laughs> oh, oh my, oh my goodness! It's it's truly incredible. So, Vuccius is not, and that, that's why I say a bit of a downgrade from Thomas because he's 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 siding with the Thomists of his contemporary time period, who are actually a return more toward toward an Aristotelian view on a, a few of the more technical details. So, so that's in, important to note from the outset. But uh, yeah, broadly speaking, say for uh, for uh, Thomas Aquinas, divine simplicity is the attribute that we posit specifically in the face of any sort of creaturely diversity, where you have in the created world all sorts of perfections that are spread about, rather than being densely packed into a, a core perfection. And when we talk about the, the absolute divine simplicity, we're looking at the scattered arrangement of perfections and we're noting that that scattered array doesn't have an equivalent entailment for the divine uh, that, that he's scattered and there are, there are parts outside of parts and these sorts of things. So apart from the real distinction between the divine persons which, which is, is, is very explicit in, in you know, leaving to the side. We're not going to deal with Trinity. We're going to deal with something that's more fundamental to Trinity, which is the divine simplicity. So apart from the real distinction of divine persons, all distinction that you find in God for Thomas is going to be thanks to the, the finitude of creatures in some respects. So you have the divine unicity, the divine perfection is going to be purified or made manifold uh, for the creatures and in the creatures and by the creatures. So the diversity as a diversity is not in God. There's still going to be a rational distinction between the attributes. So the attributes aren't synonymous to each other. They're not going to be emptied of all sorts of, uh, you know, positive conceptual content. There's still going to be a rational distinction that obtains. So as we talk about God, we don't say that his holiness means the same thing as his love and these sorts of things, even though existentially speaking, they are the same thing. Right. Uh, this, this rational distinction, which, which is deals with a uh, later Thomas than, than Thomas developed into uh, two sorts of rational distinction. This, and this becomes quite important to understand. So on the one hand, you would have a, a rational distinction of the reason reasoning and then on the other of the reason reasoned, which are very awkward in English, and they are somewhat awkward in Latin, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's denoting a very different way of how that rational distinction results. And there's going to be one way that divine simplicity uh, has to go, and the other way is, is going to be very bad. So Vucius sides, in my opinion, uh, correctly on the reason reasoned side. That's reason reasoned with a passive verb in the sense that there's something that if I think of it like this, that forces the mind toward this, the mind in its recipient posture of this uh, causes this rational distinction. It's not simply imposed by the mind, which would be the reason reasoning. So the rational distinction which Vuccius gets into, and this is really the nub of divine simplicity for him, goes something like this. Uh, a rational distinction is something that the mind makes up, totally made up, in order to generate true knowledge. Uh, it's specifically a rational distinction because when the mind makes it up, which is happening all the time when, when we know something, in certain cases that making up doesn't have something that corresponds to it in, in the object that's being known in, in reality. So even though the knowledge that we have, which is true and truly derived, 
involves in the process of our coming to know the, the use and the making of rational distinctions, those rational distinctions don't track onto the object that's being, that's right. being. Yeah. Just, uh, I'm going to be the, be the, uh, the foil here of the, uh, <laughs> the neophyte questioner, uh, which, you know, <laughs> Is about half true in my question. So, so just to for the for the listener's sake, there's there's always an issue even with contemporary interactions with the doctrine of simplicity, where people to be overly simplistic. Pardon the pun; I didn't intend it. But people people will say, "Well, if God's identical with all of His attributes, then then His attributes must be the same thing." And so, if God is love and God is just, and love equals justice, they're identical. That's just nonsense. So God can't be simple. Now, I don't want to make light of it, but because there's more to that objection, but that's that's the basic case. And and to me, that, that objection has always seemed to, as if it's just coming from a, a real anthropocentric position. You're starting with humanity and man's mind's ability to understand. And then you say, well, if I can't understand it, because how could love and justice be the same thing, then therefore God can't exist as a simple essence and his attributes cannot be identical with his essence because my mind can't comprehend it. Therefore it's false. This is a much more helpful kind of revealed theology way to think about these things. So there can be distinctions that can be helpful for creatures to, in order to think about and articulate true things about God, particularly things that God has revealed to us. But yet these distinctions while helpful and useful do not necessarily Necessit- they don't necessitate that that God would have that He would be made up of all these components, like just a bunch of blocks of attributes that are put together, so that God could somehow be reduced to more basic constituent parts. All of His attributes combined, God is not the sum of parts. He is who He is. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit exist as three persons in one essence, always and everywhere. So, I mean, just. That the the introduction of a rational distinction here is a helpful way that that the orthodox theology has dealt with this problem, and there are answers to some of these objections that are coming from people within the last decade or two, who may or may not be aware of the fact that these problems have been dealt with for hundreds of years already. It it seems to me that uh, before I, Ryan answers the the distinction that he's getting at. It not may not be exactly the same as the uh, objective subjective distinction, right? Or, yeah. Good or point. in re versus in in the mind, uh, although that's part of it. But it's also really it's it's having to grapple with the fact that the, with the creator creature distinction and the doctrine of analogy. In other words, mm. you're affirming God's one thing and we're another, but He's made it possible. For to, he can communicate with us and we can talk about him. However, it's stretching the limits of human knowledge and human language as we do so. Although, again, affirming that God has put his stamp of approval on a certain way of doing this. But that I think, you, so you've got the creator creature distinction in the doctrine of, of analogy in the working in the background. Uh, in th- without it being said so much in, in this discussion. The, the objection, as you posed it, is uh, a very serious objection that I think lands on a lot of even contemporary accounts that I would broadly agree with uh, that, are, that are defending the, the you know, we, we talk about them now as classical theists. That's, that's more, more of a recent development as sure. far as naming goes. But a lot of the, the presentations of the divine simplicity that most people would be familiar with uh, outside, of, outside of scholarship or, or what have you are going to be presenting the divine simplicity in terms that that precise objection that you've just articulated lands very aggressively. And, uh, and that's, that's the fault of, of the, uh, you know, the, the presentation, not, not the view itself. And it's, it's actually this precise issue that Vuchis is heading off at the pass when he's siding with the reason reasoned with a, with a D at the end, rather than the reason reasoning 
So if you were to go, for instance, and, and maybe we can leave the technicality to one side, but just to say, if you were to go with the reason reasoning uh, way of, uh, of, of, of a rational distinction, that objection would, would destroy your, your account of divine simplicity, you would be done. And so this is planning, and this is Cornelius Planinga's objection. And uh, it lands very, very powerfully on many Thomists because they're, they're actually mistaking this point, uh, unfortunately. Whereas you, you want to go the reason reasoned route. And, and again, perhaps we, we could leave the technicality aside for uh, why one would want to do that because it does get extremely technical. But it's very fascinating to note, and this is something that I, I don't, I've not seen any Protestant and certainly any reformed guy mention with respect to this issue. And that is that uh, this is something that uh, somewhat plagued Thomas himself. So just moving out of the Thomists uh, for, for a moment, back to, to Thomas. Uh, so something is very, very interesting to think about is that when he originally wrote his sentence commentary as a bachelor of theology, and he goes through the divine simplicity, he casts it in such a way that it lies very susceptible to the reason reasoning distinction. And there was a large dogmatic heresy sort of inquiry that was launched against a junior fellow of his who was following him. Hmm. His name was Peter of Tarantasia, uh, who, would, who would become Pope Innocent V, who was a year below Thomas as a bachelor student, who starts presenting Thomas's view. And this, this large charge is, is uh you know, launched against him and against Thomas because precisely because of these sorts of issues and these sorts of objections that you just brought to the table. <laughs> so Thomas comes along behind and well over 10 years later, rewrites his account of the divine simplicity to deal with this objection. And uh, so, you know, it, it's important to know these sorts of interesting historical bits uh, because it reminds us that the, the, the doctrine of the divine simplicity is a very, very difficult doctrine, that success in is something of a sliding scale and how far you can how far you can keep the argument going and in, in, in these sorts of things. And, and that is, uh, so, you know, we've been we've been talking quite a bit about the doctrine of divine simplicity and about the variety therein uh, in orthodoxy, but it would be useful so we don't presume to at least state what Vucic's is, um, what, what is the doctrine of divine simplicity at its very core, at its big, most basic level for him? How does he formulate this doctrine? Yeah, at, at its core, it's going to be an attribute that you talk about in order to ensure that all of the diversity that is present in creatures is going to be denied in God. So uh, if you think about the divine simplicity, for instance, wrongly, as something that empties out all of the creatureliness and then posits an empty notion of the divine, you've missed the point. Mm. The point of the divine simplicity and the way it operates for Vucis, for the Orthodox, for everyone really in Christian history up into, well, a century or so ago, it's uh, it's a, it's an attribute that's positive and uh, pointing out the fact or alerting us to the fact that God is a density of all perfections. He is a having of all formal perfections among creatures, so much so that the having is no longer a having, but simply a being of them. And uh, this is, is very important to, to realize. And this is why I say that, that simplicity is much more of a function in theology rather than an attribute as we often think about it today. I think that a lot of people are quite confused when they, and this is why it's so dangerous to abstract simplicity from its, from its job in the systematic ta task, but I think they think about the divine simplicity uh, analogous to all the other divine attributes that we, we posit of God. So when we, when we say God is love, we mean something by that 
Whereas right. when we get to the divine simplicity, it's just a negative attribute. And wait, we're supposed to deny all the, this doesn't make any sense. And the reason why is because it, it doesn't really quite work like that. It is out there to make sure that when we predicate a perfection of the divine, we ensure that the way of our predicating, which entails diversity and entails the needing of a unifying cause, that both of those things are denied as tracking on, on God, or the object of our knowledge. And, and that's really what simplicity is doing for Butchus. Mm, very good. So he spends a lot of time, uh, even though this, this article is, is not like book length treatment here, we still have so much material packed in, which I sympathize with you and how difficult this might have been to translate. But he, he lists in very scholastic way, uh, you know, all of the arguments, uh, kind of seriatim. See, I know some Latin too. There you um, go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and starts to build and develop uh, his arguments uh, for the doctrine of, of divine simplicity. Um, we don't need to work through every single one. We can, if you want, but uh, I'll just open things up to you to, to, to highlight some of the ways in which he starts to build this doctrine, both from scripture and then also, you know, through what we would call good and necessary consequence. I think a lot of his arguments quite useful and, and compelling, especially as he's interacting with and trying to um, counteract much of the, uh, the heresy at the time from various places, such as Sassanianism, etc., yeah. Yeah, I, I found, uh, just personally speaking, maybe two or three arguments or objections very notable because they had, uh, well, they reminded me of certain things that I hear quite frequently today. Sure. So, for instance, one objection was uh, the divine simplicity is not in Scripture. And I found it very fascinating that the group that is bringing this objection to the table is the heretical group, the Sassinians, who are something of a strange motley lot, but they're yeah. very biblicist in the bad sense of the term, right. not, in the, not in the good reform sense of the term. So here they, they bring to Vuchis, it's not in scripture. And then similarly, uh, uh, I think it was argument two, uh, simplicity is just philosophy, and we're, you know, we're doing theology, and therefore, you know, you need to get this out of the sphere. Of, right. This is a this is a, a takeover of from Aristotle, and it needs to be uh, left left to the wayside. And Vuchis, um, I find it so fascinating, and I was very thankful, personally, that he begins the defense of this doctrine of the divine simplicity, even before he gets the objections, with just the quotation of, of some Bible verses. And, uh, you know, Vuchis, uh, for, for his own position, there's absolutely no antithesis between natural theology and supernatural theology. God is the, uh, the one author, both of nature and grace. It doesn't mean that they're, uh, you know, one order. There are two different orders. It doesn't mean they're equal orders. Theology is the higher order and these sorts of things, but they're going to be working together in articulating various, various attributes of God, uh, not something like the divine trinity, of course, but for Vuchis, he's going to be able to take arguments from nature and uh, redeem them for the use and service of faith-seeking understanding. But as a theologian, he starts simply with the quotation of scripture. Because that's that's what he's doing. He's act. He's wearing his the his theology hat here. So to answer some of these objections, uh, you know, on the one hand, Vuchis doesn't need to uh, show that simplicity is in Scripture in its very words. He just needs to show that all the components are there and that Scripture doesn't say anything opposite or these sorts of things, and it can be can be gotten there by good and necessary consequence. And, uh, and, and, and he's done. That, that's all he needs to do because he recognizes as a Christian, again, God is the author both of nature and grace. He's not going to give us something that produces some sort of situation of double truth, some scenario where we have something that's actually true and actually the case in the natural realm, 
It's not actually the case in, in, the, in the theological realm. So, you know, on the one hand, it's a non-objection for him. It's a fascinating point, and perhaps you read this at the end, but one of the questions, the, the issues for further reflection, as it were, that he appends to the very end is uh, dealing with very much the question, uh, quoting from memory, uh, can you show the divine, can you prove the divine simplicity only using scripture without good and necessary consequence and without the use of philosophy? <laughs> so that's a that's another question for him and as far as i know this sounds like a comprehensive exam to me is this <laughs> yeah. it, it is oh man it's a wicked question man it's it's naughty um yeah as far as i know he he didn't answer that question in a disputation formally uh you know dedicated to that but he deals with that in other disputations for instance the use of human reason in matters of faith which he refers the reader to um, but it's it's an interesting question that, uh, well, maybe brighter minds than mine can can take up. Uh, but yeah, the second second argument, whether simplicity is just philosophy and not theology, you know, which his answer is, yeah, simplicity takes the form, the the external form of philosophy, but in itself, it's just outworking what the scripture says. And uh, this is this is in uh, this is a time where very openly he admits that uh, a, a whole lot of his treatise is going to be metaphysical musings, and that's okay because he's taking philosophy as a handmaiden or a servant to the faith in seeking understanding of of the divine, not allowing it to supplant the faith. Um, so he can concede uh, on the one hand, yeah, it looks metaphysical. Uh, but actually, it's just what the scripture says. I appreciate uh, his point there. And of course, if I were in that conversation, having that kind of a conversation today, I suppose I might say something like, and so what? If it is metaphysical, the Bible is metaphysical right. in the sense of think, dealing with things that are above the physical. I mean, God is above the physical. Angels are above the physical in their normal uh, existence. <clears throat> so that hardly is uh, a damaging, for me, it's hardly a damaging thing to say that we're dealing with metaphysics. And if philosophy is love of wisdom and the seeking after truth, then, then by definition, it's, you know, theology is going to uh, reflect, uh, have overlapping interests with historically with philosophy, theology will. Uh, the question, I think, really, it, it needs to, the criticism needs to be fine-tuned. In other words, an argument has to be made that in a given situation, a given issue, uh, unbiblical thinking is running roughshod over biblical thinking, which which is a more specific. And then you'd have to be concrete, right? You'd have to give con concrete examples, but the the of course, we've been de debating the relationship of faith and reason or theology and philosophy for thousands of years. Uh, so it's not going to go away because I think it's, you know, an unnecessary. Uh, it's not a, a necessary uh, problem if we are wise. Sure. Oh, my. If we are philosophical in our understanding <laughs> of the relationship of theology and philosophy. Yeah. Well, anyways. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned, Jeff, just um, what's been going on in the church for thousands of years, and that's one of the arguments, uh, at least in the ballpark of an argument that Vucius makes regarding uh, the consensus of the ancient church and the fathers to all those preceding arguments that he made. That was the sixth out of, I don't even know how many here, sixth in this series, so he he also definitely sees himself as somebody within the tradition, you know, perhaps addressing some contemporary issues, but he doesn't uh, apparently see himself, certainly not as constructing a new doctrine. He's developing um, arguments and presenting arguments for things that uh, the church has been advocating for for years and years and years. And so in that way, it, it's, it's uh, helpful to see how this doctrine 
The importance of this attribute, the divine simplicity, transcends the particular challenges it faces in given uh, historical context. Uh, so I think the thing I learned the most about this is just how much the more we, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? <laughs> like we, we, when I'm reading it and reading a, again about his arguments with Sassinians, and you realize how <laughs> fresh this seems in the present day, even though we don't have any avowed Sassinians, there's still people using the line of thought that many of the Sassinians did. You realize, look, you know, the divine simplicity has been under attack for for centuries. And even in the span of 500 years, well, 400 plus, uh, between Vucius and Sassinians and, and us today, um, it seems as if people in the church, you know, forget that these things happened before or that there were arguments or the, or we just didn't know. And and it's a, it's a reminder that the, this is why we, we should read books <laughs> that are old, right? <laughs> Rather than only reading you know, whatever the latest uh, publishers or book, book sh- uh, bookstore is uh, marketing to us in the present. Of course, you have the whole question of things not being translated, right? Because yeah, so Latin, if Ryan would Latin just, you know... A, a, a dead language in terms of being used. It At this point, it's still an international <laughs> language, right? I mean, it's dead in the sense of it, it's not the language of, of the Roman Empire in the sense as it was in the days of the New Testament. Uh, but but it's, it is a universal, it is a lingua franca of the academic world. It, it but, is. But classes, if, are, classes right. are all held in Latin. All, all theologians, all seminary students, you know, our equivalent of seminary students are speaking Latin fluently uh, during this time period. And and you're right uh, in the former point that was made with respect to which is, is just standing in as one guy in a very, yeah. very long line of doctrine. And part of the reason why he can get this far on a very difficult doctrine like the divine simplicity is because of what he's reading. Right. So one of the primary texts that informs this work is a four volume work, which is a lovely read, by the way, it's perfect for your <laughs> nighttime table. Uh, I actually have it on my nighttime table. I have it printed <laughs> out uh, to, uh, to, to just sit there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the work by Johannes de Rada, who was a Jesuit theologian at the University of Sal- Sal- uh, Salamica uh, a few generations before Vucius. He was a Scotus, and the book is titled Controversies Between Thomists and Scotists. Mm. And it's uh, a very, very profound, very significant work. The, the faculty there is probably the most significant theological faculty in the world uh, for many, many, many generations. It is, it's quite, quite a profound faculty. Suarez was there, Banyas was there, De Soto was there, all of these guys. And Vucius is just taking all of their work and uh, Really, if you go if you go read Rada, it, it's very clear that Butch has had it on his nightstand too. And this gets back to the previous thing about the Latin. At what point do we begin to see a downgrade? In other words, we we forsake learning and reading the Latin texts, and in the and as well, they're not translated. Or it's a it's a small percentage of a large body of literature is translated. So if we don't read Latin, we're not going to 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 know a, the the details about these discussions. Yeah, it's it's a great question, and you see even during this time period, the entire theological world is starting to to downgrade in the in the 17th century and moving in the 18th. Also among the Roman Catholics, they're, they're, they can't keep it together either uh, at all. And so uh, you have in the entrance of the modern period, a, a few centuries of, of real theological darkness, especially on these sorts of issues, on the more technical and the finer points. So people are still reading a lot of these resources, but they're not, they're not understanding the underlying metaphysics, right. uh, which is a lot of the issue. Um, and therefore it, it's it's almost like they don't know the language yes i mean that's it's 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 the we can't know what we aren't 
given access to, I guess, is, is, is the point. And, and, and uh, there's a, what's happened, I suppose, since the, the, the beginning of the Mueller revolution in church history and historical theologies is that men and women have, have become Latinists. Perhaps, I don't know if the study's been done, but there's been a greater emphasis, at least in our circle, Fair on the re recovery of, of uh, riches that we haven't had direct access to in, since the originals. Yeah, and the, the, those two things, uh, I'm very conscious of the fact as being a younger man myself, the two aspects that, that most set up my generation for theological success, humanly speaking and humbly speaking, because we, we can only, you know, if the Lord gives success to future generations of theology, we can only thank him for it for sure. But two of the most important factors are the return of Latin and things like Google Books and PRDL. Yeah. And the fact that I can read works that have not been read in, in centuries, but were digitized five years ago and are now on PRDL or, or various other websites like that. And uh, no theologians have been able to do that for, for many, many, many decades. And so the mm. Lord is really blessing us and allowing us, hopefully, if we're faithful, to bring these riches down also to the pew eventually. Yep. No, that's a tremendous point, and um, we live in, in unprecedented times, and it's we have such a wealth at our fingertips or our thumbs, <laughs> whatever we happen to be using uh, to connect uh, over the Internet, but it still requires the discipline and the time to to study, to understand the language. But it's one thing to know the language, as you've, uh, you've alluded to. It's another to know the theological language, so to speak. I mean, you can know Latin. You can even know the technical jargon and the words. But it's another to understand the theological tradition and the reasons the ideas that are being worked out, so the, the vocabulary of, of ideas and controversies. And there's no substitute uh, from just patient, careful reading, uh, especially within the context of the, of the church, and uh, deep and long contemplation of these matters. These are not just things you can read quickly and then you've got it. You have to wrestle with with these distinction with with these distinctions with these ideas, in order to be able to to internalize them, but also just to understand with the the depth and rigor that the that the writers that the writers do, and I think that to me is perhaps the biggest challenge, because we live in 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 a world of of uh, quick uh, pleasure and uh, fast moving short attention spans and uh, just instant gratification that. It's more of a challenge and a danger to the church um, that even if we have the resources, even if we were proficient in Latin, the greater challenge is the fact that people just don't necessarily want to put in the time and the mental effort and the heart effort, the the, the piety, I, su I suppose, to, to do this scholarship in the way that it used to be done. You're actually getting it, and, and uh, Ryan no doubt knows about this, the, the whole idea of the habitus, that there is a habitus to the theologian. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I recommend know. a book on that, Habits of the Mind. I forget the, the author. I can look it up, but uh, maybe brothers have read that. It was published by IVP years ago. But, yeah, uh, I forget who the author is. I'll find is, it here. But, now I'm but, embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, but, but if you read um, – Muller, I'm sure, uh, has discussion of this. The the idea that there's a a certain disposition uh, that a theologian has to have. Now, part of it would be generically regeneration, but there's also an, an aptitude mm -hmm. for uh, it's a. Would, Ryan, maybe you can correct me, but would this be the convergence of natural uh, aptitude and supernatural uh, endowment? Yeah, it's yeah the ha the habit of of faith, um, similar to the metaphysical habit um, that you have to develop over years and years of careful meditation and right. uh, and you're you're absolutely right. This is where I think Christianity um, needs to to really bring its its force to the fore, and that is uh, when we talk about habit, it's not an exercise of your brain power, 
it's a development of holiness. And the great, theolo great Protestant theologian, John Webster used to call theology as a mode of holiness. And all of these reformed Orthodox guys uh, are, are working on the opposition that there's no possible way for you to contemplate God intellectually when you've got your mind full of cre creaturely things. And they don't mean that in the sense that creatures are bad or evil or, or in some you know, way of divorcing yourself from the world. It's talking about properly ordering oneself to one's environment and the creatures that one interacts with day to day and viewing them in light of the eternal. And so absolutely, you know, the, the, the church fathers are, I think, some of the best uh, representatives of this in the history of the church. And that, that is the divorcing of the, of the baser passions that are tended towards sin. And uh, this is the only way to properly think of God. Wonderful. Yeah, the book uh, that I was uh, trying to struggle for, the author, is James Sire, Habits of the Mind, Intellectual uh, yes. Life as a Christian Calling, published by IVP back. It was a 2001 Christianity Today book of the year. It's on my shelf, and uh, apparently I need to keep reading it. <laughs> but uh, I have a friend who says he reads it every year, and uh, maybe I should become one of those people who does it as well. So a good reminder. And uh, thanks so much, Ryan, for doing your work of, of translating this. It's been uh, a true joy to have it and for, for me to be able to have access to something that uh, was inaccessible to me prior. But also thanks today for taking the time to, uh, to speak with me and with Jeff about these things and, and exposing them to our listeners. It's, it's been a privilege. And the privilege is all mine. Mm. Well, we encourage you in your labors, and uh, we hope that uh, we, can, we can see more of you in the future and, and read more uh, from your translator pen and your pen and of, of commentary. I think uh, the introduction in this, in this uh, essay was really, really useful in its own right. Uh, but, of course, you can, find out, uh, you can find this article and subscribe to the Confessional Presbyterian Journal if you head on over to cpjournal.com. Uh, you can find out information about ordering copies and uh, subscribing, excuse me. And uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, you can head on over to reformedforum.org where you'll find information on all of our programs as well as uh, our courses and other things that we have available online. And subscribe to the email newsletter to find out uh, immediately uh, when, when things are happening. But I do want to thank everybody for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.